Hi there. My name is Alyssa Rausch, and um, I'm coming to you from Denver, Colorado. And I am a specialist with the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center. This presentation is called Indicators of Inclusion, Community-Driven Inclusion in Oregon. While you won't see her or hear from her on this presentation, Meredith Valines, who is the Oregon Early Childhood Strategy Specialist, um, helped, we developed partner together to develop this presentation. And um, you will see her at the Q&A sessions um, in July. I want to acknowledge that um, her partnership in this work and um, her and gratitude for to her for um, all of her work and commitment to inclusion in Oregon. I want to start today um, by just taking a moment to describe myself um, to you all. And before I go on to the presentation, um, as I said, my name is Alyssa Rausch, and um, I am a white woman, and I'm coming to you from Denver, Colorado. And I am in my home office here. Um, it is a yellow room and there's um, some plants behind me, as well as a picture of our beloved Colorado aspen trees. Um, I am wearing a green dress and um, my silver necklace with stars on it. My hair is brown and it is pulled back and I am using my AirPods uh, to record this video. Thanks for having me here with you today. Let's get started. Here is the disclaimer slide uh, for the 2022 OSEP Leadership and Project Directors Conference. The contents of this presentation were developed by the presenters for the 2022 OSEP conference. However, these contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the Department of Education, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. Before I move into this next slide, which features some of the work of the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center and our partners, I wanna talk a little bit about the purpose of today's meeting and the presentation. Um, I'm gonna start out by talking with you about the indicators of high quality inclusion and the intensive technical assistance that ECTA has been engaged with for um, the last two years with Oregon as well as with some other states. Um, then we're gonna move into talking specifically about community-driven inclusion in Oregon. We'll talk about the purpose, we'll talk about the methods, we'll talk about some of the content that we used um, to move community-driven inclusion forward. Um, and then, we are going to share some data from communities in Oregon who um, agreed to share some of their data with us related to um, inclusion of children with disabilities in their programs and the preparedness of the communities and programs to work in partnership with one another to serve children with disabilities in the setting that they would be served in if they did not have a disability. So we're excited to um, share some of this with you today. I wanna start out by talking a little bit about the work of ECTA and the intention of this intensive TA project that um, we were engaged um, in in Oregon. So what we know um, at, at, by the bullets at the top of this slide is that statewide implementation based on implementation science really requires us to have a few things in place. So these four items that you see bulleted here are what we know are the essential structures that are required 
to get statewide implementation of inclusion or statewide implementation of any evidence-based practices. The first thing we know is that you need a cross-sector state leadership team. You need folks at the state level from across different areas and agencies um, engaged in early childhood work to come together um, around a mission or vision supporting inclusion. And um, that is a really key piece of how um, the state needs to prepare to move this work forward. We also know that you need a network of coaches. This is essential. And in this case, we're not talking about coaches that actually work at um, the classroom levels. You do need those. But this is really a network of implementation coaches. And in this presentation, as we're talking about community-driven inclusion, this implementation coach role is super important. These coaches support not the practices that happen in inclusive settings, as much as they support the actual implementation of state of statewide, community-wide, program-wide structures that make it possible for providers to engage in inclusive practices with children with disabilities and their peers. So this is really a statewide network of coaches that support how communities come together to implement inclusion. So we call them implementation coaches. You might also um, hear them referred to as program coaches. The third piece that we know is critical, essential to statewide implementation are implementation and demonstration sites. These sites are critical because we know that implementation science and improvement science is best sort of tested and moved along in small and varied contexts, right? So what we need are um, different programs, different communities, different providers, different leaders to work on implementation, to gather data and to share with us what it is they learn about what it takes to implement in a specific program, place, geographic area. Over time, as sites develop fidelity around evidence-based practices, they can then become demonstration sites. And those are the sites that are so important in showing others, what does this look like at fidelity? What does this look like? How could we accomplish it? What does it mean? And so these implementation and demonstration sites are super important in moving this work forward because they provide the opportunity to practice and work toward implementation of evidence-based practices in small and varied contexts, and then ultimately become the demonstration sites that show what does this look like so that folks um, in other not implementing places can see how it's done. The fourth essential structure, uh, to nobody's surprise, is really around data and evaluation. Um, and this is really what we know runs through all of the other pillars or all of these other essential structures. We know that um, data and evaluation are used to inform the decisions that we make. So they're used to inform how the state leadership team moves forward. They're used to inform what is effective around coaching for implementation. And those data really drive what our next steps are as a state, as a community, as a program, and as a practitioner. And so um, these are the four essential structures that we know are key for uh, implementation of inclusion or any statewide implementation of evidence-based practices. Um, there is the box on the left-hand side of my screen that's labeled indicators of high quality inclusion. 
is a screenshot of the ECTA webpage where we feature the indicators of high quality inclusion. And I wanna take a second just to talk a little bit about what these are in case you don't know. Um, the indicators, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the what, the why, the how, and the who of how they came about. But the indicators of high quality inclusion are a list of all of the leverage points to support inclusion at all of the levels of the system. So we know that inclusion happens at a systems level and that it is not incumbent on a single provider, on a single program, or a single partner to make it happen. And so ECTA, along with their partners, developed these indicators that cross all of those levels. You see there, there are state indicators for the state leadership team to consider. There's community indicators for communities, local program indicators for programs, and then early care and environment indicators that actually are the practices that support inclusion at the early childhood environment level. Notice that we use environment um, rather than classroom because we know that young children with and without disabilities are served um, in a variety of places, including school-based programs, child care, um, family and home child care, and faith-based and other community um, schools. And so what we wanted to do was really be inclusive of all of those environments where children are present. So why did we develop the, the indicators of high quality inclusion with our partners? Well, I think as you know, um, services for children with disabilities um, are siloed in many states. And they're siloed um, into Department of Education places. And um, that is wonderful. And states really do um, a good job of working through their LEAs to implement programming for young children with and without disabilities. But we know that the services for young children with disabilities exist in lots of different places. Um, they also exist across the Department of Human Services and include things like Head Start and child care and family home child care. And so rather than having um, you know, one set of indicators for one specific type of services for young children, we really did follow the uh, joint policy statement guidance and the recommendations um, in that guidance from 2015 to think about how do we work cross sector um, and really create these inclusive indicate these inclusion indicators that will move inclusion forward across all settings um, and support children across all settings. So these indicators um, were developed from, um, first of all, the recommendations from the joint policy statement, but also from 40 years of literature around what we know related to evidence-based practices for inclusion, what we know for program level implementation, and what we know from implementation science around how do we move systems and make change based on those, based on um, system on work within systems. We developed these indicators across two years um, with partners, um, many, many partners from inside the Department of Education, from the Department of Human Services, um, state partners, other TA centers, um, these included our, our friends at Head Start, our friends at Child Care Aware, um, our family and home child care um, partners, professional organizations, um, to really think about 
what would it take to create a picture of optimal systems and environment for inclusion? So this list of indicators is really just that. It is a list of if everything were in place and everything were ideal, here is everything that would exist to support inclusion for young children with disabilities in early childhood. I want to move now to the um, to the graphic on the right side of my screen. Um, this graphic is representative of the process or the the way we thought about the structure of implementation in Oregon and our other partnering states. So as part of the intensive TA, we did ask Oregon to establish a state leadership team, as well as a network of program or implementation coaches, as we talked about in the essential structure. Because we know that children um, are served in lots of different settings across communities. We asked different communities to come together and build community inclusion teams. Those are cross sector teams from geographic areas, from municipalities, from districts, from cities, where their common goal was inclusion and serving young children with disabilities in the setting that they would be served in, regardless of whether or not they had a disability. Those community inclusion teams then together selected implementation programs within those communities to implement the local program indicators, as well as the early childhood education environment indicators. So that's the structure that um, we really used to um, in Oregon to move this work forward. What we want to talk to you about today is really that purple level, that community inclusion team, and um, sort of the innovative way in which it um, operates to support all children and families in any geographic area. So let's take a second to talk about community inclusion and the purpose of community inclusion. Oftentimes when we think about um, inclusion or any educational initiative, we think a lot about LEAs or districts or administrative units or collaboratives um, rather than communities. And so this is really a very different way of thinking about this, not necessarily new, but different. And honestly, uh, unfamiliar um, to, to lots of um, administrators, providers, directors, families. Um, and so we wanted to be really clear about what was the purpose of community inclusion. Again, that overall goal was to support the implementation and sustainability of high quality practices across the community. So regardless of where um, you're serving young children, that you could implement high quality inclusive practices. Community inclusion also supports the sharing of professional development, staffing and funding, including how to increase, braid, coordinate resources, and make the most of sparse resources and identify new funding opportunities. So we know that while money flows into systems, this, the community, the purpose of community inclusion is to really help funding um, follow the child, right? So how do community programs work together to think about how they could coordinate resources to allow for services for children 
um, where those children would be regardless of whether they had a disability. Community inclusion also has a very important public awareness aspect to it. What we want to do is really show at a community level the importance and the value of high quality early childhood education and inclusion. And we want to link high quality programs to the public, to the community, to restaurants, to entrepreneurs, to um, city council members, policymakers, um, those in pre-service and in-service education, including student teachers, the media, and larger institutions of higher education. We also know that community inclusion needs to collect and share information about how the community is doing in providing high quality education for all children, inclusive education for all children. And finally, um, community inclusion seeks to identify and support any program that wants to implement evidence-based practices over time, thereby scaling up a system that is high quality inclusion. So what is community inclusion? What does it look like? And what methods did we implement in states to support community-driven inclusion? So the first thing we did was we brought together community inclusion team members. And this is really thoughtful and intentional membership of folks within communities that really help to support children with and without disabilities. This includes, of course, local education agency, administrators and providers, related service providers, special education teachers. It also includes willing partners from childcare, from community-based preschool, from Head Start. And it also includes members from other um, agencies within the community, pediatrician's office, um, infant and early childhood mental health consultation, all sorts of folks who serve young children with disabilities and have a vested interest in high quality outcomes for them. So the teams that were developed within each community were representative of those folks that had a vested interest in improving outcomes for children with disabilities and their families. We asked those community inclusion teams to get together monthly. And what's interesting is that most of the community implementation that we engaged in occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so while programs were serving children outside of their environment, while they were working with families um, to work with children during quarantine and 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 provide supports for them that way, to provide telehealth services, to provide online resources and opportunities. These community teams came together monthly to talk about what do we need to put in place in terms of policies and procedures to be ready to move this work forward at a community level when children um, return to in-person learning. And these teams, did just that. They really put the effort and the work into making sure that on a monthly at a, on a monthly basis, they were acting and moving forward um, on the vision of creating high quality inclusive envir inclusive environments in their community. These monthly meetings were set around a vision for inclusion within their community that was jointly developed by all of the community members, uh, community inclusion team members, as well as norms around how they would engage with one another and how they would work together to um, create 
policies, procedures, and the conditions under which um, children with disabilities could be served um, in their community. Finally, um, they, they made commitments to engage in meaningful data collection and use to better understand uh, how inclusion looks, how it works, who was and who was not receiving services, and how um, families were partnering in the process and really drive their decision making forward. In terms of tools for the community inclusion teams, um, ECTA and our partners um, provided monthly webinars for the community inclusion teams through the COVID-19 pandemic. We used content from the Preschool Inclusion Toolbox um, published, by Bar published in 2015 by Barton and Smith to really talk about policies, procedures, resources, professional development, and coaching that are critical for community inclusion. These teams spent a lot of time assessing where they were um, in their community practices using the community indicators of high quality inclusion. They had a chance to assess what it was they were doing well, they had a chance to assess the barriers that were in place um, in their communities that prevented high quality inclusion. And then they really had an opportunity to think about what action steps they wanted to start with based on what they were doing well, based on the needs of the community, based on what families and partners on the community inclusion team were saying, what would be their next steps moving forward? At that point, after all of that learning and after all of that discussion and digestion and action planning, communities identified programs, classrooms, and teams that they would work with to implement high quality inclusion um, within the community. So these included Head Starts, these included community childcare, um, settings. Um, and then also what those community inclusion teams did is once identifying those programs, classrooms, and teams, they identified how implementation and practitioner coaches, so those coaches that support the programs, but also those coaches that support the providers would receive their support. And um, ECTA, uh, and our partners really took the lead in um, creating communities of practice and monthly meetings with implementation coaches, as well as with pre practitioner coaches to talk about what they were facing, what it was that they were doing and help them problem solve um, with each other around what steps um, they might take next. So essentially there was this, this important sort of dump of knowledge around, here's what we know about policies, procedures, resources, professional development and coaching. Now look at where you are in this process and tell us what you're good at. And then identify where it is as a community you wanna start. After assessing your barriers, after looking at outcomes, and then go into identifying who might be your early partners in programs, classrooms, and teams. But never without support um, from ECTA and from um, existing community um, partners to help to move the work forward. I wanna take a moment now to talk about the communities themselves who um, through the pandemic, through historic wildfires, um, through lots of racial reckoning came together in 2020 and 2021 
to make some significant change um, related to inclusion. The first community that I wanna talk about a little bit is Clackamas. Um, and what you see on there on this slide is their vision. So their community inclusion team developed this vision around prioritizing access to preschool programs for all children, particularly students with documented learning differences, challenges, and desegregating preschool learning for success in all aspects of school. And um, one of the things you can see the quote in blue on the right hand side, um, one of the CIT members said, we would like to include other coaches in the county that support childcare programs at Head Start so we can spend the work in the future, expand the work in the future, strengthen partnerships and take advantage of training opportunities. So really that desire to um, reach out across sector, across um, silos and work to move um, work to move services um, into settings um, where children can access them. Clackamas decided early on um, that some of their actions would include building public awareness. And as a result, um, they developed um, hashtag elevate inclusion, which was a social media campaign um, that they spread across the community to talk about the importance of inclusion for children with and without disabilities and their families and the community at large. They also very early on um, decided that incentivizing providers to create inclusive placements for children with disabilities was a really impactful way of supporting both children and providers. Uh, Finally, um, they knew that one of the important leverage points was to provide professional development and coaching through the child care resource and referral. So a lot of kids are in those programs, including kids with disabilities and their families. And so how could um, they share professional development and coaching resources that are tr traditionally um, perhaps more in the LEA in the CCRNR, and they did just that. They also set a goal that they would increase their LRE number to 65% by 2023. Um, while we don't have that information yet, um, we believe that they're well on their way. One of the key pieces of data that you'll see across all of these community slides um, are these charts um, on the right. And this is, these are, um, this is, so upon what you see in the first column on the left is the assessment of um, community indicators of high quality inclusion um, at the onset um, of uh, the, the technical assistance. So communities were asked, you know, rate yourself on this, to do the self-assessment, think about what your barriers are, and you can see in red that they really did not have a lot of implementation of community-driven inclusion. Um, by the time they did their second, um, their second assessment, self-assessment of the community indicators of high quality inclusion, you can see how many more pieces they have partially in place or being planned or fully implemented. And again, I just wanna be, I wanna remind folks that this, these two points of data were all during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the fact that these community teams were able to do all that they were doing to support children and families during the COVID-19 pandemic and prepare um, to have kids return to in-person learning and be ready to do this um, is truly, truly exceptional. Community number two is Lincoln. Um, and similarly to Clackamas, Lincoln has a vision statement that um, their community was going to align with Oregon's Early Childhood Inclusion Initiative. And that they believe that every child should have the opportunity to learn and develop together with their peers, friends, and neighbors. <clears throat> Some of their um, 
action planning included uh, building public awareness by hosting um, community leaders to visit with other community teams. So what they really did was create network opportunities for leaders from agencies that probably didn't really connect in the past together to do this work. Um, they also wanted to be sure to increase collaboration for cross-sector development, professional development, and that included both coaching and training. So similarly to Clackamas, they really wanted to think about how do we take prof great professional development and coaching that's happening in one sector related to inclusion and get that into other sectors as well. Um, they also developed some agreements or some um, understandings amongst themselves around community vision and values. They set out to increase their LRE to 30% by 2023. What you see here on their date in their data is um, <laughs> indicative of um, the pandemic. So you do see here that um, they were planning lots of stuff. That's that orange in the first column. They had lots of stuff ready to go. When the pandemic hit, lots of things did have to come to a halt as they redirected services to support children and families at home and in quarantine. Um, but then very quickly, they were able to return back to let's get these things going, let's get these things moving, and let's do it in a cross-sector way. And these data are representative of that. All right, the third community is Multnomah County. Um, and Multnomah includes Portland, so this is a very large um, county. And what they wanted to do was increase the capacity an understanding of equitable and inclusionary practices and awareness for families and early childhood providers so that all children and families in Montnomah County could have access to high quality, culturally appropriate early learning environments of their choice where all children can maximize their potential. So again, they really sought to say, families, where would your child be if they did not have a disability? Then let's create an inclusive setting there. So um, some of their early action items included collaborative teaming with cross-sector partners, including childcare, as well as um, office, as well as their Head Start partners, and improving communication among partners. So they really did dig down deep into the communication processes that were happening. Um, or not happening um, between those cross-sector partners and sought to improve how do we share information um, among, among ourselves as an early childhood care and learning field across silos. They also really focused on high quality training and coaching for everyone in the community related to inclusion. And they sought to increase their LRE to 60% by 2023. You can see on, um, on in their data as well that um, between their first assessment and their second assessment, they had some tremendous growth, um, both in what was actually being fully implemented, what was being partially implemented, and then again, what was being planned. Um, for this community as well, um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic was real. And this again, um, uh, this, the, the pandemic created an opportunity for community members to come together and think about their communication, think about their collaborative teaming and work together. I wanna just end with this slide. Um, this is the Oregon State Leadership, early um, Oregon Early Childhood Inclusion Shared Values. And um, this is really where their state started in terms of how are we going to do this? This was the vision that they developed as a state in a cross-sector way that really empowered the communities to do this as well. And so um, this, this is really indicative of looking at a multi-system, multi-level way 
of um, tackling um, hard challenges um, within the state related to um, evidence-based practices and the implementation of inclusion. Um, but as you can see here, individually we are a drop, but together we're an ocean. Thank you so much for being part of our session today. And we look forward to hearing more um, from you in the future.